The death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life. Where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we don't we see... We still, them. to a large extent, live in the interregnum between, between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Diet Soap is a Sublation Media podcast. So Kuba Zhevnetsky is known as Deep State Kuba on the podcast This is Revolution. He is a former employee of the State Department and a business consultant who has worked for many fine capitalist institutions, including many banks and the Illuminati. Deep State Kuba, welcome to the Diet Soap podcast again. Did I get, Thank did I get, you. Did I get your, your bio roughly right there? Um, close enough for government work, as we like to say. Okay. Uh, um, the... It was not an employee, but a contractor, and it wasn't state, but defense. But apart from that, okay, the spirit right. of things and the <laughs> Illuminati. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So the Defense Department. Um, and uh, yeah, so you're here today to educate me on foreign affairs, on, on what's happening in Japan. Um, uh, this is one of those instances where I realized that I am an ignorant American. Shinzo Abe uh, was a member of the conservative liberal Democratic Party of Japan, the former prime minister, one of the I think he, he held the office for the longest amount of time of any prime minister uh, from t- 2012 to 2020. And he was assassinated uh, just last week. How do we in the West or just in the United States or on the socialist left internationally? How should we think about what just happened? Well, the it begins with trying to understand the internal politics as well as the geo strategic um, orientation of uh, post war Japan. And despite how enamored the internet is of um, anime girl avatars and um, the vlog waifus. Um, there isn't much understanding of the structure of Japan's economy or um, its political system. Uh, generally speaking, things, attitudes range from assumptions that because it's a developed um, economy and a stable democracy, it must be like the United States um, to uh, just... Um, kind of chrysanthemum and the sword that isn't way too um old a reference um orientalism about japan being inscrutable different um and uh, kind of not worth examining too closely because you'll never get to the bottom of it um the reality is uh, somewhere in the middle it, it's it, a constitutional monarchy it's a constitutional right. monarchy correct mm-hmm. um the uh, emperor, is, the imperial family still exists. Um, the emperor um, has a palace in Tokyo, and there um, is more reverence attached to uh, the imperial family than, for instance, the British royal family. There's as much interest, but there's more cultivation of uh, dignity, which is much more of an Asian value than, uh, especially associated with leadership figures, than um, most Westerners intuit. Um, The way that political figures get dragged in the United States, you know, let's go Brandon or um, Cheeto president, um, just to pick the last two, uh, or even European figures like the um, British royal family, the type of criticism um, and personalization, humanization that the Western media engages in routinely, that Westerners take for granted um, as in their relationship with uh, people in power is uh, considered 
tactless and out of place when applied to um, Asian leadership, which, uh, and you can see this in countries like um, China as well, where it's not necessarily a, a royal family, it's not a monarchy, but nonetheless, the uh, national leader has a sort of superhuman detached quality that you don't ask about their personal life. You don't follow what's going on with their kids necessarily. You treat everything uh, reverentially. Mm -hmm. um, and that harkens back to the pre-World War days when the imperial family was considered um, literally divine, that the emperor was uh, within the Shinto worldview, um, a, a deity in and of um, himself. And um, part of what made um, the Japanese nation distinctive, superior, um, and what made um, Japanese fascism um, particularly uh, virulent. Uh, they didn't have the same Aryan race philosophy as the Third Reich, but the emperor worship um, served a similar role in um, isolating and elevating uh, Japanese in the minds of the nationalists um, above the other branches of humanity. Uh, is, is the Shinto tradition still politically significant? It is, yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, um, and that's um, one thing that I wanted to get into a little and in discussing um, what happened with um, Shinzo Abe, mm -hmm. uh, there's a plethora of religious groups involved in politics in Japan. And unlike the United States, um, where generally speaking, uh, politicized religion is an outgrowth of traditional Christianity. Mm -hmm. In Japan, um, in addition to Shinto, and um, which is not a unified church, there's different shrines and different um, uh, priestly families that have different interpretations, different politics, don't necessarily agree. Uh, you don't have a kind of Shinto right like you have a Christian right in the United States. Um, there's the Buddhist tradition, which is likewise fragmented, but also a plethora of what are called new religious movements, mm -hmm. which go from foreign imports, um, including branches of Christianity that um, might be considered mainstream elsewhere, to... Um, very unusual cult-like organizations. Um, the Unification Church. Like the Unification Church, um, which was originally Korean, but um, partly thanks to the efforts of Shinzo Abe and elements of the LDP, was able to make inroads within Japan. Um, also, more notoriously, Aum Shinriku, the uh, meditation cult, that released sarin gas in the Tokyo subway um, 20, 20 or so years ago. Yeah. Um, and these groups have different orientations towards politics and different politics. So some of them are closely tied with political parties. Um, some of them avoid politics, but it's a completely different ecosystem than what Westerners are used to. And it's generally something that foreigners are, um, overlook entirely when trying to make sense of the internal goings on within Japan. So, let me ask you a question about religion and and the government. Uh, it's a constitutional monarchy. the the it, it, the, the imperial form of government was uh, dropped after World War II, um, and a constitution was uh, adopted. Uh, what there was a pre-war constitution. Right. Okay. Oh yeah, that's that's significant. But okay, in that constitution, was there was Shintoism given a, a prominent 
place or was there religious freedom built into the constitution before uh, World War II? Was is religious freedom uh, an, a, a major component to government in Japan now or, or civil society? Uh, to what extent um, is religious freedom and, and uh, the politicized religions tied together uh, in Japan? So the original Japanese constitution was promulgated in the um, late um, 19th century, I believe. Um, could have been in the early 20th century. Um, the, um, it was modeled off of uh, the constitution of Prussia. Uh, explicitly in order to avoid the popular sovereignty um, theory built into uh, Anglosphere constitutions and the French constitution. They did not want sovereignty to derive from the people. Um, rather, sovereignty was the exercise of monarchical power. And the Prussian constitution enshrined the, uh, the king and later the Kaiser as the source of of uh, sovereignty. Mm. And similarly, the Meiji era constitution, 1890, um, was presented. It wasn't signed or accepted by the Japanese people. It was presented to the Japanese nation by the emperor, bestowed on Japan by the emperor. And it, of course, began with the recognition of the divinity of the imperial family, of the imperial house, and Japan's distinctiveness as a result. In that way, it enshrined Shinto. And um, Japanese culture traditionally um, has had a ambivalent orientation towards freedom of religion. Um, in a very Asian way, with parallels to um, China and Korea, um, you had a coexistence of multiple religious traditions in the pre-modern era. Uh, Buddhism, of course, and then Shinto as the pre-Buddhist um, Japanese native religion. Uh, when the West was first encountered through the Portuguese and Dutch. There was a quite successful early missionary activity work, especially by the Catholic Church, uh, the conversion of um, several major daimyo who were regional princes um, that sometimes enjoyed de facto sovereignty. Um, so with them went their territories and there was a considerable uh, Christian population as a result, but the Christian lords were on the losing side of the reunification wars of um, the 16th century. And as a result, uh, Christianity was suppressed quite violently. And a lingering suspicion was attached to missionary activity. That suspicion is less the result of the kind of spiritual monopoly that you get with Abrahamic monotheism, whether, I mean, the, the Jewish variant is important only with respect to Israel, but uh, both the Christian and Muslim variants uh, claim exclusivity and uh, have historically been willing to enforce it. Uh, the Japanese suspicion of missionaries has less to do with the fact that they're wrong and more with the fact that they're foreign. Um, it's part and parcel of a xenophobia that runs deep in um, Japanese history. Um, it's not the only current, and certainly there's uh, interest and an eagerness to learn about the re uh, rest of the world that balances the xenophobia. But it would be um, it would be disingenuous to pretend that the xenophobic tilt wasn't also there, and the uh, 
So during the period leading up to World War II, the Constitution um, became less and less relevant. Um, after 1890 through to the 1920s or so, there was a lively multi-party democracy in Japan. The position of um, the military was constitutionally elevated beyond civilian government. So the army and the navy were uh, accountable only to the emperor. The civilian government was also accountable to the emperor um, and did not have authority over uh, the military. But for about this 20, 30 year period, it was unclear if Japan would evolve in a more liberal parliamentary direction um, or whether it would um, revert to a um, militaristic form of authoritarianism. It, it sounds to me like when I say after World War II, Japan was a constitutional monarchy, I might as well have said it had been a, a constitutional monarchy since the late uh, 19th century. Yeah. But was it a different... Did the constitutional monarchy have a marked different character after World War II? Was it? Oh, yes, different? absolutely. Everything changes um, with World War II. Um, and the um, similarly, everything changed in the with the turn towards uh, militarism and uh, the most aggressive phase of Japanese imperialism in East Asia. Um, the there were flappers in Japan, right? There were good time girls. There were speakeasies. People danced to Charleston. Uh, there was a period of time when Japan, um, at least significant portions of the Japanese public, uh, embraced um, cosmopolitanism. And, uh, for instance, there was a significant communist party. Yeah, a socialist say, party. yeah there, was a social, there was a struggle for socialism before World War II in Japan and, um, and after World War II there was, yes. uh, as well. And the, um, so there was a lively left. There was um, the uh, fascination with foreign ideas and the assimilation of a great deal of uh, Western science, Western political thinking, uh, enlightenment liberalism. Um, the very notion of a constitution was something that uh, Japanese embraced um, and adapted from Western models. But with the turn towards aggressive imperialism in uh, the 1920s and especially in the 1930s and the outbreak of the Asian theater of World War II, um, that openness towards the outside world is reversed into a uh, virulent xenophobia. And as much as um, Western prisoners of war suffered, like, uh, for instance, British and Americans in the Bataan Death March, um, and the mistreatment of um, Western internees, civilian and military, by uh, the Japanese imperial government is, is notorious, is very well documented, very, uh, at least in the, you know, previous generations was very well known. Um, it was other Asians that really bore the brunt of um, the victimization of Imperial Japan, uh, especially Korea, uh, China, uh, suffered losses in the millions of people, including things like, um, including losses to biological weapons. Uh, there was a uh, unit in, um, of the Imperial Japanese Army in Manchuria, Unit 731, that was responsible for um, scientific research into uh, different forms of unconventional warfare. And, and they even weaponized plague fleas as a means of um, depopulating um, urban centers 
in China, and they released them. Um, the and it was a rape of Nan King, or of course. Nan King, yeah, right. Okay. Of course, and um, Korea had a Japanese occupation since 1895. Um, mainland uh, China was a battlefield until the end of um, World War II with um, genocidal levels of violence um, applied to the Chinese population. But similarly, Indonesia and Vietnam, under Japanese occupation, were subject to forced requisitioning of rice and other staple crops, leading to the starvation of hundreds of thousands, millions of Southeast Asians in order to feed the Japanese home islands and in order to feed the Japanese military machine. Um, so the level of suffering inflicted um, across East Asia by Japanese imperialism was uh, extraordinary. And one of the individuals who had a leadership role in this imperial machinery was um, Shinzo Abe's grandfather, um, the, um, I had his name up uh, just a moment ago, um, the, who ran the economy of the, um, puppet state of Manchukuo, uh, Nobusuke Kishi. Uh, he, Japan carved out um, a puppet state in Manchuria, Manchukuo, um, headed by um, a Qing dynasty prince that uh, they propped up in order to maintain the legitimacy of, to try to buy some old imperial Chinese legitimacy. Uh, and it was the site of a major industrialization push modeled on the Soviet five-year plans. And Manchukuo indeed was a case of um, economic planning, non-socialist economic planning, um, in order to buttress and expand the Imperial Japanese war machine. It involved um, hundreds of thousands, um, if not more, uh, forced laborers conscripted from across Northern China, as well as the um, state-led coordination of uh, suppliers of raw materials, and producers of um, iron, industrial components, railroad companies, etc. Mm -hmm. The it was not socialist. The private industrialists of Japan, the so-called zaibatsu, were involved as private partners. In fact, it could be thought of as a private a public partnership, um, just the interwar variant. Uh, and it was quite successful in achieving the economic war aims of Japanese imperialism. Of course, none of that had anything to do with industrializing Manchuria for the sake of the residents um, or for the sake of um, just domestic economic development and human welfare. No, it was about heavy industry, planes, tanks, guns, um, railroads. Mm. He was quite successful at this and over the course of the war was brought back into the Japanese um, central government um, in order to apply the same gains, the same lessons of uh, wartime economic planning to the center of Japanese industry. And the post-war Japanese miracle is for many people the beginning of the Japanese economic story where they emerge as a significant player um, and a producer of all kinds of uh, consumer products, um, electronics, automobiles, um, aviation, robotics, you name it. That expansion 
had its, uh, which allowed for this kind of super, you know, faster than market, faster than um, conventional growth, uh, had its roots in the economic models and strategies of the pre-war period, which avoided the Smithian market fundamentalism, the, the liberal economics that are dominant in the Anglosphere, and instead applied uh, models from continental Europe. Uh, specifically, there's a, a German um, economist, uh, Friedrich List, L-I-S-T, that um, pioneered a form of uh, protectionist industrialization with a prominent role for government coordinating uh, economic activity as a means of reducing the destructive elements of capitalist uh, competition. Mm -hmm. So instead of um, just letting industrialists and capitalists do whatever they wanted, uh, instead of letting uh, finance capitalism uh, dictate the allocation of resources, that role would be taken on by um, a state bureaucracy with um, specific planning goals and targets passed down to uh, peak industrial interests and a collaborative relationship uh, in order to achieve them. Now, that was one of the legacies of uh, Nobusuke Kishi, um, Abe's grandfather. Mm -hmm. He had developed this system in um, order to serve the imperial war machine. Right. But in the post-war period, when after a stint in American custody, he was rehabilitated and went on to become prime minister in his own right, mm -hmm. um, he implemented it in a civilian, commercially competitive form, which led to the economic miracle, rapid reconstruction. Um, there's an American component to this effort, which shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be elided. The United States, by importing Japanese goods and creating conditions for Japan to be able to export its uh, industrial output, uh, enabled the, the miracle, but um, without the coordinated um, hybrid planned market economy that Kishi helped pioneer, um, Japan would not have been able to, to in, rebuild as rapidly as it had. Right. Um, the, he, one. So question. another mm -hmm. good question here is like with, is this, how, how distant, was post-war Japan from Fordist America in that regard? I mean, did, did, I mean, I know leading into World War Two uh, and and during the early 20th century, um, you you mentioned uh, you know that they were working on a five-year plan in, in a similar style to Stalin's Soviet Union, um, and that there was a a massive uh, uh, effort to industrialize that would you know include kind of a, a massive cruelty to uh, to and, and to build up an industry that wasn't serving everyday people but was serving the military uh, needs of, of the Japanese imperialist state um, but uh, there it seems to me that after during and after World War II uh, Fordist America also sort of developed something along the lines of a more planned e economic model that that's what Fordism was about. I mean, certainly into the war, the the there was a nationalization of production, and and after there was a, a regulation of market forces by the state. So was it so different in Japan as it was in other parts of the world, uh, or if so, what on what basis was it different? So there are some significant uh, differences to the Japanese model, um, and. One um, 
a lot of it had to do with the place that Japan, um, the its place in the international competitive order when it undertook first industrialization and then reconstruction. Mm. So as a second mover, uh, Japan was at a technological disadvantage. So one element of the Japanese model, which is absent in the United States, is uh, what might be called forced tech transfer or intellectual property theft. <laughs> yeah. And um, many of the uh, tactics and strategies that are outrageous from the perspective of um, Chinese competition recently were adopted whole cloth from Japanese reconstruction, Japanese industrialization, things like uh, forced joint ventures with um, for foreign companies entering Japan. You, if you want to take advantage of the labor market, if you want to sell domestically, you need a local partner. You need to share your um, tech, technological specs, your processes with the local partner. And at the sunset of the joint venture, the local partner typically just takes over, becomes a competitor. Uh, the Japanese pioneered that. Um, the Another element was company unions. Now, the left has never been... Um, successful in Japan. But that doesn't mean that they haven't been active, that, or that they have been irrelevant. The Japanese Communist Party, for instance, was recognized even by the United States as the only indigenous political force in Japan that um, had opposed from the very beginning uh, Japanese imperialism. And the Japanese Communist Party has never been banned. The, uh, they've been active since the end of World War II, and uh, they still have a handful of seats in the Diet, um, which is different. And uh, I hasten to add, when I say the Communist Party, I mean an actual Communist Party. Um, there's also a Socialist Party, which briefly was able to form uh, post-war governments um, before fading into a perpetual, uh, also ran, uh, for they, they just, they, that party disbanded in the nineties, right? The socialist party. Yes. First they changed their name to the social democratic party. And since then, um, and they formed the first and only, uh, non LDP government since the 1940s. Um, certainly the fifties, but I think, yeah, I, the, think I think LDP came to be in the fifties. I looked it up on Wikipedia this morning. So they, uh, they came to be in the fifties, but the two component parties, the liberal party and the democratic party existed, um, okay, even okay. prior to that. Okay. Um, and actually that merger, the consolidation of the Japanese right was, uh, encouraged by American officials uh, the American presence in Japan precisely to undercut the competitiveness of the left. Uh, after World War II, um, the Japanese political, economic, social systems are fundamentally revamped by the American occupying force. But the American occupation is of two minds. On the one hand, they had, they had just fought Imperial Japan. They had lost um, many comrades, many of their fellow soldiers, many American lives in horrible conditions all across the Pacific theater. So feelings towards Japan were quite hard. There was um, a non-trivial minority of Americans who, when asked what their preferred post-war settlement was um, in the question of Japan, um, publicly answered that they would just prefer a total genocide of the Japanese. 
Um, I think it was like 20%. Um, and the, and right. The one, no, th this is in a, just the American public or uh, the American public. Wow. The, um, so in, um, For instance, uh, Dr. Seuss, who is generally treated as a um, humanist, liberal hero figure. And, yeah, don't go after Dr. Seuss. Yeah, uh, I, I, I don't hate him. Uh, not at all. But um, it, when he, he did propaganda for the United States during World War II in its fight against the Axis powers, again, that's, that's the right thing to do, what you're going to do. It, uh, the World War II is not the one that you want to take a principled um, anti-war stance. You're, you're, you're literally fighting Hitler and Japanese imperialism. Um, however, the way that Japanese imperialism was presented was as a racialized, um, dehumanized evil that came out of um, the Japanese almost biologically. Whereas um, the fascism, the, the National Socialism in the Third Reich was more presented as the particular brainchild of Adolf Hitler and a kind of mania, a kind of insanity that befell an otherwise redeemable people. Which, of course, if you fundamentally dehumanize, you're going to get that annihilation, annihilationist fever, especially in a society steeped in white supremacy, um, as World War II era America. Um, again, it's not the only thing happening in the United States, but it would be disingenuous to pretend that um, white supremacy wasn't a major component of the, the culture and the public political outlook. Yeah. Um, in any case, um, there was a very strong um, push to dismantle any basis of Japanese power, uh, industrial, military, you name it. Hence the pacifism of the uh, Constitution. The Constitution, the post-war Constitution, incidentally, like the Meiji Constitution, was not written by Japanese, it was bestowed by, in this case, an occupying power. Since then, there have been revisions, but um, arguably, Japan has never been governed under a, a popular sovereignty constitution. I, I, I want to read you something, and you can tell me who you think hmm. said this. The Japanese people since the war have undergone the greatest reformation recorded in modern history with a commendable will, eagerness to learn, and marked capacity to understand they have, from the ashes left in war's wake, erected in Japan an edifice dedicated to the, suprem to the supremacy of individual liberty and personal dignity. And in the ensuing process, there has been created a truly representative government committed to the advance of political morality, freedom, of economic enterprise, and social justice. Politically, economically, and socially, Japan is now abreast of many free nations of the earth and will not again fail to, to the universal trust. So who do you think said that? Douglas MacArthur. That's correct. Ding, ding, ding. The... the General what? Douglas MacArthur. Yeah. Well, I mean, in a lot of ways, um, he's being asked to comment on his own work. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah, totally. Yeah. But um, the... And um, there was a thoroughgoing um, renovation of... Uh, Japanese institutions from the height of politics all the way down to um, interpersonal relations. Um, uh, the most egregious forms of, for instance, family authoritarianism, patriarchy were broken down. Um, the uh, Similarly, the left in the form of uh, unions as well as the Communist Party and the Socialist Party, played an active role in uh, politics. Um, the large industrial firms were reorganized. Um, the same model 
reemerges with some different terminology. Uh, but there is an effort to um, New Deal style, you know, democratize the economy. Um, and you have the demotion of the emperor from divinity to constitutional monarch. Um, I mean, he had been a constitutional monarch before the war, but more in, in a different way or. So he had been a constitutional monarch in the sense that he was a monarch that gave everyone a constitution right. that was subject to revision when he changed his mind. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, sovereignty still flowed from, um, right. Just to remind me out. You said that earlier. And, I and, and he was a god, too, right? Mm -hmm. That was, it was um, the official policy, the official constitutional law in Japan prior to World War II that the emperor was a god, literally. Um, and the, um, and, you know, you worship the emperor at school. Instead of doing a pledge of the allegiance, you worship the emperor. Um, so that ended. Mm -hmm. um, the teachers union actually, which was very left wing and remains very left wing, um, played a significant role in changing the educational system and in introducing a kind of pacifist, um, understanding of Japanese history and world war two. Uh, the role of the security services was demoted, right? The Navy and the army were abolished. Right. Whereas before they had a status equivalent to that of the entire civilian government. Um, now that those radical changes triggered major social upheaval, um, including um, strike action by uh, leftist unions in order to rebalance the economy in their favor. And also, uh, this was a period when the Cold War was heating up. So many of the further left elements were sympathetic to the Soviet Union. And for instance, um, unions in Japan um, might oppose the Korean War, seeing it as a quasi-imperialist um, intervention against a socialist uh, revolution. And that contestation emboldened the second part of the second element of the American occupation, the second tendency, which was forgive, you know, if the first one was punish Japan and change everything, the second was forgive Japan, strengthen them against the Soviet Union, crush the left. Um, which is what happened. Um, specifically, unions were targeted since a revived Japanese economy was instrumental not only to the future of Japan, but also the ability to supply American forces in first Korea, later Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. The... Um, shipping everything in from the United States would have created significantly higher burdens to those interventions. Having this offshore industrial capacity that could be flexibly repurposed for um, battlefields across Asia, very advantageous uh, to American anti-communist efforts. So, the typical um, post-war account of um, labor struggle was that um, independent leftist unions triggered a crisis within Japanese ca um, capitalism and similarly um, the American occupation. Um, endangered Japanese reconstruction full stop so conservative forces together with um, the American occupation officials and elements of organized crime crushed the unions 
and replaced them with company unions mm -hmm. uh, along, once again, the German line where you have um, representatives of workers, but within companies. And it is true that those unions weren't pure patsies. They didn't just roll over and do everything that management told them. They were effective at securing um, certain rights, um, certain standards for um, workplace safety, uh, worker autonomy, worker input in the process, uh, leading to a completely distinct variant of capitalism with some unique and one could argue superior features to American uh, Anglo-American style neoliberalism. Yeah. But, Do you remember the movie Gung Ho? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. The, um, uh, I think with Michael Keaton. as right. um, yeah. yeah. And the. In that film, just for people who don't remember, uh, it's all that's it in the in the mid 80s where the American public is afraid of Japan again, but not because of we're afraid of their uh, kamikaze pilots, but because we're afraid of their imported cars and their superior workers who are, you know, apparently without personality, just dedicated to their jobs and hardworking as opposed to the beer swilling swine that was the American worker. Lazy, lacking in discipline. Yes. Right. But, and, but lovable, lovable in the movie gung ho. In yeah. I mean, lovable until they beat Victor Tim to death. Right. Uh, <laughs> but the um, it's, and the, the whole basis of the movie is that we can learn from the Japanese, right. That there is something to um, worker uh, management uh, cooperation that when you're not contesting the structure of the economy, when power is off the table, there is a common, there can be a common benefit to working together. Uh, one reason um, why um, the United States has experienced such severe deindustrialization compared to France, compared to Germany, compared to the Scandinavian countries, even compared to uh, relative European laggards like Spain and Italy, and as well as Japan, South Korea, etc., where you know Japanese car companies continue to be world dominating, um, while American car companies just have dried up and, and desiccated, um, has to do with the fact that the coordinated model of um, capitalism, where rather than having a purely adversarial relationship, unions and management can, um, in some areas, collaborate and recognize a shared interest. I mean, that's better in established industries. That's just a better way of doing labor relations within the logic of capitalism. You right. don't even need to go, to go to socialism to recognize that this is advantageous. It's a kind of power mad obstinacy in um, the United States and the UK, combined with a uh, hypertrophied financial sector that leads to this um, adversarial relationship between labor and management and the cannibalization of its own, of their own. Um, I thought you were going to say industry. that the American labor movement was too close to the IWW, you know, like it was all the fault of the labor movement in the United States who thought that the interests of workers and the management could never be reconciled. No, no, no. Oh, no, no. Oh, oh, heavens. No, no. Yeah. The, um, the fault is it's bankers and bosses. It is, it's not the work. No, no. Like the, um, the, and it's, it's, easy to identify because you just have to ask who has the power, who's defining the relationship between management and labor. And in the United States, all of the market power, um, all of the political power. I love that gesture though, Kuba. He was like, between, you said, between management and labor. And that, that was... <laughs> <laughs> um, anyhow, <laughs> go on. Um, uh, I definitely am worked more like, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm dressed more like I'm in, in labor, uh, Right now. Yeah. But, After um, this, we're doing evaluations. 
Okay, okay, that's I'm I'm ready. I'm ready. So uh, uh, my quarterly review is is it's here. Um, yeah. So so let's go back to the news cycle for a second. I mean, um, this guy Shinzo Abe uh, was a conservative, right? A nationalist. Uh, go ahead. Well, he was part of the Lim- Liberal Democratic Party, um, and he was followed by a moderate. According to you know, I'm just skimming the surface research, you know, within an hour before talking to you. What is the, the nature of the Liberal Democratic Party? Is it factionalized itself? Is, are there factions within it? Are there moderates and liberals and leftists and conservatives within the Liberal Democratic Party? Is that the full spectrum of uh, Japanese politics, really? Is just whatever can fit into that party? All right. Now. So the um, part of the American broker conservative post-war order in Japan had to do with the um, consolidation of a right of center coalition around the LDP, which ruled effectively as a one party state um, from the 19, from the late 1940s through to the 1990s where um, there was the first uh, it took the end of the Cold War to create an opening for the first non-LDP or you know liberal or democratic um, government, and that political monopoly in Japan was an element of the political economic order, a feature, not a bug. The it was um, partly maintained by uh, American style um, gerrymandering in the form of giving a disproportionate weight to rural districts uh, compared to urban ones, um, combined with lavish, well lavish, um, substantial agricultural subsidies and um, constraints on the import of foreign foodstuffs, especially rice. Uh, into Japan, which linked the uh, fate of agricultural producers with the LDP solidly and created um, hundreds of um, safe ridings across um, across Japan for the LDP. The um, policy making was also constrained by the power of the professional bureaucracy. In Japan, again, like in as in Europe, and as opposed to the United States, uh, much of the technocratic work of government is handled by a professional civil service class uh, that are recruited on the basis of competitive exams uh, that constitute a, a self-conscious elite with a particular mission and a particular source of legitimacy that arises from completely different um, sources than uh, success in um, market competition, the accumulation of capital, the accumulation of wealth. The uh, Japan is held up as an example, as a case of state autonomy, where despite the restrictions and the limitations placed on the Japanese state by the American constitution and by uh, Japan's subordinate geopolitical role. Um, Nonetheless, uh, decisions made by especially the economic bureaucracy um, can be uh, stick and are imposed on even peak um, corporate interests rather than peak corporate interests dictating whatever policies um, they consider to be advantageous to them commercially within the market. Mm -hmm. Um, So the LDP, part of their uh, success also had to do with their ability to cultivate a relationship between political leaders and the elite bureaucracy. So in Japan, you don't really have a deep state because you just call it the state. 
right? It's all out in the open. That's how it works and how it's supposed to work. Um, there's permanent unelected officials that decide 80% of uh, political issues mm. and you listen to them. Um, and far from being figures of suspicion and dread, everybody wants their son to grow up to be a civil service bureaucrat. Mm. Uh, people uh, look up to them as model citizens and as uh, a type of disinterested national leadership that transcends the sort of grubby uh, infighting of, pol of domestic politics. And through their relation, their control of the electoral system, you know, things like the disproportion, their relationship with agriculture, uh, their relationship with peak um, Japanese uh, corporate interests, right? Like the, the holding companies that were known as Zaibatsu before the war and Kiretsu after the war and with the uh, elite bureaucracy, the LDP was able to carve out a monopoly position for itself, especially since it did whatever the United States asked in terms of um, its international affairs. And politics in Japan had less to do with elections and more to do with, like you said, the factionalism within the LDP, where there are, uh, I believe it's seven official factions. Um, and the, they vary on significant issues. For instance, there's uh, pro-American and pro-Chinese factions when it comes to international politics and um, regional politics. There are... Um, relatively pro-market factions, which want to um, disempower the bureaucracy in some ways, shift more autonomy to uh, corporate leadership, as and Keynesian, um, sort of deep state all the way factions. There are factions which are more socially conservative, and there are factions which we would describe as uh, somewhat progressive. Um, there are factions that are closely tied with Shinto mm -hmm. and with certain um, religious affiliations, religious organizations, and factions which are secularists or have different um, religious affinities. Mm -hmm. These, the competition between these factions is all handled inside the house. And um, the consequences are significant, but they're not tractable to uh, the general public and they're not subject to um, electoral checks beyond right. you can really embarrass a faction leader by um, a bad showing at the polls. Right. And that, but, but like the prime minister is not, is, is the prime minister selected by the emperor or, or the prime minister is um, whoever the diet says it is typically the leader of the largest party inside the diet. Now, if the L if you're the LDP and you know that you're going to be the largest party, then the leader is whoever the party selects. Uh, that's the prime minister. Mm -hmm. And, um, the system worked that way from the 50s until the 90s. And there was a brief interregnum when um, non-LDP governments were elected. Um, but that ended quickly, largely because it turned out that if you elect anybody but the LDP, they can't really do much without the relationships with the permanent state, without the connections to other peak interests, um, it is difficult, even assuming no shenanigans, which is probably going too far, but even assuming no shenanigans and just a completely honest and disinterested bureaucracy, bureaucratic, good civil servants that just want to do, um, want to do what the elected officials tell them to, 
any leaders that come from outside the LDP need to learn everything. They need to um, develop a sense for what the institutions are, what the personalities are, because of course, the civil service has its own factions and has its own politics. And you can't just come in as a new prime minister and fire all the current bureaucrats and hire new people. No, that would be um, that absolutely not, absolutely impossible. Not you can't even do that in the United States. I know, um, right. and or the heads or the heads of the departments, and then do a house it, cleaning that way. You, you, if you get, if you don't go after everybody, then you, especially in a system such as Japan's, where every junior has a senpai. Every um, official has um, mentors and their own mentees. So even if you remove the top layer, um, you're not replacing them with um, unmolded, unstamped, virgin um, personnel, but you're just moving everybody up the org chart. Um, right, right, right. So, um, and not only that, but like there would, it would be scandals to do that because these are figures that culturally are treated as the best and the brightest. The rec, um, the public generally accepts that, um, and not everybody, of course, there's, um, for instance, the, assassin of Shinzo Abe clearly had was much less deferential to uh, the <laughs> Japanese system than, um, than I'm describing. But um, generally speaking, people, uh, Japanese people accept that their system to the extent that it works, it's thanks to these people who are doing their job and they're dry, trying their best. So if you wanted to blow it up without first delegitimizing it, um, you would face a public outcry even without any mobilization by the bureaucracy that's being attacked, which of course would mobilize as well. Um, so, and if you, you don't do that, you're just going to sit there and not and basically have the bureaucracy operate without your huh? knowledge. You're well, not, you can't do you can't micromanage from government on the level necessary to, and, to change the course of policy making, really. And this is one reason why the LDP was able to um, reestablish an essential monopoly by um, convincing the public, look, we're the only people that um, know how to run this thing. And there is diversity among us, right? We can if we're reading the signals right and you want a reformer, we can find a reformer within our seven factions. Hmm. Um, and they'll actually be able to, you know, do something if they say they will. That turns out to, that has yet to be proven conclusively, but um, LDP leaders have been able to do more than non uh, LDP um, leaders, even if um, their platforms were further from what might be thought of as a popular um, popular positions. Uh, the, when, did the, when did Japan have its big economic crisis again? Was it early two thousands? No, uh, the economic crisis started in the nineties. Uh, okay. The nineties were the original lost decade. Um, after that, it never ended. Um, the Japan has um, seen very low growth uh, ever since the um, economic crunch, which was brought on by a financial bubble. Um, there was the vast speculation in real estate in Japan in the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, the there used to be an expression that anyone who failed to get rich in the 80s was either an idiot or a foreigner um, because 
you would you could take whatever um, capital gains came from real estate anywhere in Japan and just plow them into the stock market, mm -hmm. which would multiply them. And then you could go back into the stock market or buy more real estate. Mm -hmm. um, when a real estate crash occurred, it created a, a general crisis. And this is another place where the distinctiveness of the Japanese political economic model plays out, you know, becomes relevant. Um, in a lot of ways, it was like the 2008 crisis in the United States. There was a huge debt overhang and a question of what could be done about it. Um, how are we going to resolve this? Um, who's going to pay down this debt? Or do we make it go away somehow? Um, do we forgive it? Do we absolve it? Do we dissolve companies? Is this a, a situation where you know, we need 20 banks to go bankrupt? And the policy that emerged was nobody goes bankrupt. We're just going to extend and pretend everything. Um, all of a lot of bad debt that we know won't be made up will um, be absorbed by uh, the public through um, subsidies, through grants, through contracts, through um, other forms of um, relief. Yep. Which is what happened in the United States, roughly. Except you also don't wipe out mortgage holders. Oh, right. Nobody goes, nobody goes under. Um, instead, we're going to have, we're just going to grind it out and extend this over such a long time horizon that there won't be an acute phase. Things will just get worse. Things will just be tighter than they were before for a long time and we may have to give up some uh, features like lifetime employment um, that we took for granted in the past, but there will not be that acute uh, damage. And it's a solution, you know, um, it's an alternative. I, I have difficulty judging it a failure because looking at the human toll exacted in 2008, not just in the United States, but in places like Greece and places like Ireland and places like Spain, um, there's something to be said for just amortizing the suffering over 20 years um, and accepting a, a lower uh, level of um, growth and um, a lower sort of material standard, potentially. Um, I wonder so. if we could have done that without having larger repercussions than the Japanese economy produced. It's, yeah. it, well, it's something that I don't know. Uh, it, it's something that I think is distinctive to the Japanese system because um, with the United States, we're, where is that bureaucracy? Where is that state autonomy? Um, also, where is that inclusion of um, sort of workers or a public good, a national good, um, in addition to uh, the health of peak financial interests? Um, so, And then you add in the fact that the U.S. dollar is so hegemonic and – and the U.S. economy strength is integrated into the whole world economy in a way that Japan's was not. Well, uh, ironically, that's an advantage of the United States. It would be easier in that respect. That would make it easier to do it in the United States than in Japan. The reason that Japan isn't subject to um, a Greek-style fiscal discipline um, is that it has managed to um, make the yen, while not a dominant international currency, 
um, or not the dominant international currency, a widely recognized, widely used, widely held reserve currency um, with all transactions within Japan, yen denominated um, and not subject to exchange rate shocks in the same way as um, a country like uh, Greece or Turkey. Um, the Also, throughout the economic miracle period, one of the tools that Japan used and China used after was the um, deliberate depreciation of their currency or holding the yen low, which mm. makes their exports more attractive and makes it diff more difficult for foreign companies to import within Japan. That um, low currency value leads to a trade surplus which allows you to hoard dollars for just such an emergency. Um, the countries um, with some economic autonomy, some economic policymaking autonomy, learn from experience that you need giant cushions of money to be able to have um, some autonomy in your national economic policy. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, Russia has managed to weather these, um, the war related sanctions and, um, and supply disruptions, partly because it had accumulated a substantial foreign currency reserves in the run up to the conflict after experiencing a near national bankruptcy in the nineties under Yeltsin. Mm -hmm. Um, so Japan has got that space and the, and all of these things add up to a distinctive type of capitalism, a distinctive uh, model, which has consequences for, um, the, uh, people living under it. And in some ways, materially, the consequences for Japanese, um, are enviable compared to the consequences for American workers. Yeah. Uh, the, for instance, Japan has a welfare state. Um, healthcare is um, available in Japan and much cheaper, um, much more universally than uh, in the United States. And Japanese, the Japanese welfare state actually comes from the militarism and the deep state model. Um, when universal conscription was introduced, the Meiji oligarchs that um, governed Japan in the late um, 19th century were shocked at how malnourished and ignorant the troops that they were getting from um, the countryside, especially. Um, that they weren't suitable human material for imperializing Asia, let alone, you know, fighting a uh, Western military. So it became clear that you have to do something about basic health care, basic education, nutrition, if you're going to have a mass army that's worth a damn. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have a populist, um, you, you know, a goal that is shared by socialists, but it comes from a nationalist logic in this distinctive um quasi-capitalist system. Just going back to the, the idea that the United States could have emulated Japan, I mean, uh, for cultural and historical reasons they couldn't have, but also I'm just thinking if we tried to hold the value of the dollar down below a certain level, that would create inflation for other... I mean, the, the consequences might not be... I, I just want to think it through, like what the consequences would be for other nations and how much... Well, that's pressure. the thing, right? If you... Um, the developmental state model, which um, Chalmers Johnson uh, publishes a book called Miti and the Japanese Economic Miracle, where he introduces the structure of um, the Japanese developmental state and its distinctive form of uh, capitalism. Mm. It's possible only if you have a giant external market to export into, um, as well as a leading country to steal technology from, among other things. Mm -hmm. If you 
um, are the dominant market player, mm. then you can't lower your uh, artificially depressed your currency because that's the currency that everybody is benchmarking to. Right. Um, so if the United States pushes down its value, then everything just goes down with it. it it's actually very difficult for the dominant player to change yeah. its own terms of trade. Which is what I said, I think, a few minutes ago. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, and so you can't emulate certain tactics of uh, the Japanese model if you're the hegemon. And now you also don't have to go along with the strategy of your competitor, in this case, Japan. Right? If the United States wanted to, it could uh, have negotiated IP protections, basically done with Japan what it um, is trying to do with China. And over time, after Japan caught up, those terms were uh, redressed. Um, Ronald Reagan negotiated the revaluation of the yen um, with uh, the Japanese government and made the yen significantly stronger um, thanks to his political pressure. Did on, that contribute to the... Um the, the bubble bursting yes it, it didn't comp uh, it wasn't the bubble bursting but uh, by making the uh, the yen stronger um, the for instance one of the one of the triggers of uh, Japan phobia in the 80s was the level of acquisitions that Japanese companies um, were making all around the world. Uh, right. For a while, um, we're going to be owned by the Japanese. They're going to own all of New York City. You know? Precisely, they're, they're going to own all of LA, right? Saudi Arabians will, or you know, <laughs> right? Where, um, after all, do you remember um, in Die Hard, right? Like, mm -hmm. where was Die Hard set? Nakatomi Plaza, right? It wasn't. Right. It wasn't a German. It wasn't Renault. It wasn't Mercedes, right? It was a scary, powerful Japanese conglomerate. Uh, and the um, one other consequence, which I learned when I had a chance to travel a little within Japan, uh, is that they have, you go to a small town, a rural, rural prefecture, and you go to the local art museum, it's like, oh, that's a Rodin. Oh, that's a Van Gogh. Ah, this is what they did with the 80s money. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And honestly... Seems pretty smart, right? Like that's uh, those investments paid off uh, because at the very least you have a store of incredible art, which then helps cultivate your own creative sector, right? Like oh, the, mm -hmm. uh, Japanese artists, Japanese um, writers, uh, the Jap people who um, grow up to you know become the backbone of the Japanese culture industry are exposed to um, locally. Um, some of the, the most um, well-known and celebrated uh, artists of um, Western modernism. Yeah. Uh, what about Haruki Murakami? There yeah. you go. He originally, uh, he managed a jazz bar, right? Uh, and look at jazz music in general, right? The, at this point, um, if there's a notable jazz musician, the question is um, older black man or Japanese guy? Right, 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 um, and that's all. That all came up through the seventies and eighties, and 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 their the, the the economic model working in Japan. Yes, but the the economic model working um, also created this liminal political space for people like Shinzo Abe to. Um, move around a great deal of wealth, power, influence among um, groups like the Unification Church, Reverend uh, Sung Young Moon, um, as well as um, far-right groups, right nationalist groups within um, Japan, which have, the far-right was not rehabilitated 
um, the imperialists were not rehabilitated at any point. And they can officially World War II, Japan bad. Um, but as with Yasukuni Jinja, um, that's a shrine in Tokyo where a number of war criminals are um, enshrined. The um, It's a sort of nationalistic, patriotic, it's a little like a memorial church or something in the United States, which, you know, is tied to the memory of uh, dead servicemen, but also is a religious institution. Um, it, that is one of the institutions around which World War II revisionist type nationalists um, organize. And it's a significant component of um, the LDP. Uh, it, now, this is important it's not, that, that he, it's he, limited he, to one or two factions. It's not yeah. everybody in the LDP, but. No, no, no. It's like the fa it's his conservative. Faction. Yes, Abe's faction. So Abe's faction, and he was a, a revisionist, meaning he denied the atrocities in Korea. Particularly. Minimized. 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 Yeah. The there's it's very difficult to go straight denial, um, but it's one of those things where yeah, sure, there were comfort women and. Some of some of what happened was absolutely terrible, and we feel really bad for those like nice Korean girls. But you know, some of them were sluts. That you know, <laughs> like maybe they didn't even mind. Um, and the that type of chipping away at um, at the received accurate narrative of Japanese. Why? Why did he? He came up in 2012, right? I mean, yes. He, he's a relatively recent player, um, and my, from my, you know, uh, Gen X perspective, recent. Uh, what was it around that time that made a, a nationalist, revisionist, uh, interesting to the LDP, to the factions within the LDP, and and how did he gain power, and what political uh, need or social cultural need was he filling when he took power? Well, the did it come out of this long depression of Japan? Was that the was it was Japan demoralized after that length of austerity or? Yes, I mean the short answer is yes, and it's not austerity. Um, that's the not thing. A, Every, yeah. We're not but dismantling it's a slow burn of of yeah. deprivation. Uh, exactly. Um, and the um, there was a very clear it's very clear to everybody in Japan that the political and economic system doesn't work like it used to. That um, the material condition and the life opportunities of people in contemporary Japan are massively different than their parents and their grandparents. Um, not all bad. Um, but that lack of dynamism, that difficulty to advance, right? Like you're running, but you're staying in the same, staying in one place. Yeah. The rate of marriage is, declining right people are yes. having a hard time breaking out of the nest they, they you hear about these kids in major cities living mm -hmm. in 24-hour cafes and yes and all that. yeah the and part of that has to do with a reaction against the pressure of um the economic miracle generation right there was similar to the United States after World War II, but sort of a generation later, um, you had all of uh, these families that had their lives, their entire sort of personal existence structured around the economic development, the economic recovery of the country. So the father goes to work the mother stays at home. The children are raised to 
replace them. And this is happening in the 60s and 70s for Japan? This is happening in the 60s and 70s in Japan. Um, and if you, um, the model is uh, robust enough so that if you're putting in your time and you're a good worker, you can support a family, you have your cookie cutter vacations, you um, have your steadily um, increasing um, salary, you buy the, um, the goods that are being produced, um, you don't necessarily have the same type of space and the same types of comforts as uh, an American family would, but uh, you in enjoy a great deal of security and in, in knowing what tomorrow is going to be and, like. And, and the working class and the middle class are not that that far apart. And the if you um, there's a, an element of the working class which um, I, I think that the way one of my professors put it was. Um, you know, there are people in Japan who are born honest, hardworking, and poor, and they'll die honest, hardworking, and poor. Um, the big companies push down um, economic pressure onto suppliers, which have suppliers of their own. And so there's a class that's that doesn't rise, but it's relatively small um, compared to um, the working class as a whole. How is that divided up? Is it rural versus urban or uh, the, where, where are you going to find the working class that doesn't have any much of a chance to rise or to have that middle class existence? And I'm talking about not now, which mm -hmm. I'm assuming is more common. But now. when the system worked. Yeah, when the system worked. Like where? So um, it is going to be it's going to be urban okay. um, and it's largely going to fall on social outsiders. So foreigners um, and people of low birth in some way or another. Is that right? Foreigners in this case, meaning um, Koreans who may have been born in Japan, who may have been born in Japan for several generations, um, who may speak Japan, maybe perfectly acculturated, but nonetheless foreign. Um, similarly, there's a um, traditional lower caste called the Burakumin um, that face discrimination and um, would get frozen out of opportunities uh, disproportionately. Um, the sometimes it could be as simple as um, a scandal in the family um, makes you socially un untouchable um, or a criminal record as a teenager that might do it and uh, it's a system that's very unforgiving um, if you fall uh, into debt, for instance, um, that could be a life ruining um, moment, right? The, which also creates a system that disfavors uh, entrepreneurs and mm -hmm. de-incentivizes the creation of new businesses because the risk of default is, uh, is just total life ruining. Um, right. It's not just that you owe a bunch of money. No. Like you can't. You can't get a job after that. You can't. You, you can't owe. To... You owe a bunch of money, and uh, bill collectors that are probably affiliated with the yakuza are going to come, and they're going to take everything, and um, they'll keep doing that until you kill yourself, and then they're going to do that to your family. Wow. So, yeah, that. Don't don't borrow money, um, and similarly, like unless you're an insider, um, the banks aren't going to lend you money. So you have to go to the sketchy gray economy um, in order to access funds. 
And this, all of this breaks down in the nineties. Um, and one of the first things that dries up is the uh, cradle to grave employment system. And instead you have flexible contracts. It's, it's akin to the independent contractor um, dodge that uh, Americans experience um, or the 35 hours per week uh, scenario where yeah, right. you could be denied part benefits. Part-time worker. Yeah. Part-time worker. Um, and that's an extension. That's one of the costs. That's one of the ways in which you adjust over time, right? Like you basically force it on the younger generation that um, has to figure out a different economic environment. Um, now. Yeah. So in, in, in the nineties, when it, when that, I mean, it used to be, yeah, if you were Korean or if you're, you know, part of the class, the old caste system, the remnants of that, you wouldn't be able to get ahead. But for most, the majority of, of the Japanese people, it was a pretty good life. Then in, in, in the nineties, there was the economic, downturn it didn't just have a crisis overnight there wasn't a massive uh, uh blood you know bath but it just became slowly but surely harder especially I mean, for the younger there people. was a crisis moment yeah um there was a collapse of um the real estate prices and then the stock market mm-hmm. but that didn't translate into a broad you know we're taking away a million homes Right, or, and, or you're losing your job. Or, instead, yeah. over time, um, things uh, started, you know, opportunities dried up. And the there's, there's even more complexity to it. Um, mm-hmm. So in the 90s, it was a kind of I told you so moment for neoliberal economists. Right. Like this is what happens if you don't let the market do what the market wants. Right. Like we told you, Japan, we told you. Um, And there was great pressure for Japan to basically do what everybody else was doing, which is neoliberalism. Mm. And without articulating an anti neoliberal um, program, Get successive Japanese governments listened to that advice and got dressed down at the G7 all the time and, you know, had Paul Krugman um, tut-tutting them, Larry Sanders, you know, finger-wagging. Um, and just sort of... Larry Summers. Right? Larry Summers, yeah. Yeah, you said oh. Larry Sanders. Oh. <laughs> the... Um, Man, that would be a terrible mashup. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Bernie and Larry Summers together. Exactly. That, that, I, I think that would that that mashup would tear itself apart. Exactly. But, um, yeah, yeah. And but uh, sub- uh, consecutive um, Japanese governments just sort of acknowledged the criticism and promised to change and didn't. Right. And it was never the plan. Um, but rather than challenging a kind of hegemonic neo global neoliberalism, uh, Japanese governments just chose to sort of smile, nod, wait it out, which is a negotiation tactic that Japan um, used to great effect during the period of, uh, during the heyday of the developmental state. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I this is a stereotype about Japanese people is that they smile and nod and do what they want anyway. They, you know, very polite, uh, yeah. but, but Honestly. Op- obstinate, yeah great way to manage the United States. Yeah, right. right. Because, because we walk away thinking, Oh, they're going to do what we want. Look, look, if they, they didn't agree with us, they would say so wouldn't they, it wouldn't just let us. And uh, no, no, no. But, um, uh, so this guy Shinzo Abe, uh, he was, a uh, he was a neoliberal. Yes. Right? He started, he started yes. getting Japan involved in these, uh, exactly. International trade agreements. And, but when did, I mean, he didn't take power until t- 2012. After the economic crisis, after oh, well, the Olymp- you know, after after um, twenty years, two lost decades. Um, so I mean, the international 
two thousand eight yes. economic crisis. You know, yes. where where in America, lots of people were going, well, that's the end of neoliberalism. Yes, he was four years after that. Yeah, and, I mean, look at Macron too, right? The um, it's it's kind of um, every once in a while you meet foreigners who um, have drunk our Kool Aid, right? Um, right, right? And the um, there were there were even in the LDP, which is a sort of center uh, center right formation, um, there was a contention about whether or not um, neoliberal policies would even work, um, whether they were uh, possible, let alone desirable, um, and the fact that nothing worked. Nothing seemed to work, meant that eventually you got around to well, it's it's Abe's bite at the apple. Um, also, the neoliberalism is part of a package which also included um, remilitarization, uh, changes in foreign policy, and cultural conservatism. Yeah, which is not how it would manifest here, right? I mean, not after Clinton. Um, yes, the um, and. Um, in some ways, too, you could, if you do remilitarization, that can be your way out of the neoliberal austerity, the kind of military Keynesianism, where um, you can use the military budget to reflate whatever you take out of um, subsidies or other transfers to um, the uh, uh, industry. 70s Brazil, which was neoliberal and a military dictatorship at the same time, um, which was odd, but you know that's at least my understanding of it. Well, um, the it makes much more sense in um, Brazil's case actually because the risk of neoliberalism, um, and this well understood by other Japanese uh, governments, well understood by European governments, is that you shred the social fabric between the working class and the, the state, that you are undoing what got you labor peace, or at least labor regularity. Um, and in Brazil, there was never labor peace because the uh, yeah. Social inequality is so severe, while um, in Japan, um, you did have your golden age and um, your... So, the, so in, in the case of Abe, uh, uh, you, you're having this promise of a nationalist project and a remilitarization as a kind of ideological justification for the coming inequality that your neoliberal politics can might predict? Or okay. you, um, right now, you're propping up um, construction companies, parts suppliers, other elements, uh, sort of other marginal elements of uh, Japanese industry through subsidies or um, low interest rates or other means to... Um, reduce their exposure to debt pressure. Right. And because those firms are still open, they can employ people. And that's, you have, it's essentially an indirect transfer to certain categories of labor. Um, you know, everybody gets their pass through, but you are saving these jobs. Um, now let's cut those off. Um, and maybe cut into certain public services because the teachers unions are all commies and we don't have any kids. So why do we have so many teachers? Um, and instead push that money to, um, Toyota to make tanks and Toyota is going to hire, um, good company union men to build those tanks. Mm -hmm. And that way you might create more cradle to grave. It's, it would be a means of using the military budget to recreate partially for certain advantaged groups the type of um, employment protection and stability 
that their grandparents and parents enjoyed during right, the but it would, but, but it, but it's going to be one which doesn't really overcome the growing inequality that was happening in Japan. Well, that's, already. but that, but here's the thing: like one, yes, the inequality in Japan was growing, but they they have enviable, an enviable Gini coefficient um, by world standards. Um, because things are worse now than they were before, doesn't mean they're bad, relatively speaking. Mm -hmm. um, and two, the population is shrinking. So one of the rejoinders, um, one of the responses rejecting neoliberalism in Japan is like, look, we don't need to grow at 2% or 3% to deliver prosperity. If we have 1% growth, if we have no growth, but our population is shrinking by 1%, that's going to preserve our per capita GDP, which is the actual, like, look, don't worry about the kids. Their parents will die and they'll inherit the money. Mm. Problem solved. <laughs> um, at which actually uh, Junichiro Koizumi, um, who was one of the relatively successful pre-Abe uh, prime ministers, at least in terms of his electoral record and his haircut. Um, he, he actually said that quiet part out loud. Like he was, I, I finally sick of the, um, you know, Paul Krugman, Larry Summers um, criticism. And it's like, look, yeah, everybody's telling us it, except more immigrants. Let everybody move to Japan. Everybody's telling us, make it easier to fire people. Just shred your entire social contract uh, because you need to get your 2%, 3% growth. And it's like, oh, do we? Because the population is shrinking. We don't actually need more stuff. Um, it'll be fine. Not wrong, incidentally. Um, the And the Japanese, the current Japanese population in some ways is another legacy, one of the, a great demographic legacy of World War II. Um, prior to the end of the war, the military government, I mean, economic planning wasn't just about widgets and um, airplanes and um, freighters and submarines. It was also about biology. You had highly pronatalist policies um, incentives for settler colonialism in Korea and Manchuria and other parts of mainland Asia and Taiwan. Um, and a, an expectation, right? You looked at all of your geopolitical plans and said, like, we need more soldiers. We need more sailors. We need more children, right? Come on, Japanese women, crank them out. We need as many as we can get. When the war ends, the both the military demand for young people, young men, and the imperial outlet for colonists dry up. And the colonial project is rolled back, even in areas which had been under Japanese imperial rule for generations. Um, you know, Taiwan. So there was no post-war baby boom in Japan. It was, um, there was probably a baby recovery, but also all of the colonists, all of the people who had settled in Taiwan, all of the people who had settled in Korea, all of the people who had settled in Manchuria. Came home. Came home. And so and, there was a boom then. That's, and the, there was a baby boom generation in Japan. The, uh, there was a population explosion. Right. But one which uh, was never intended to fit in the home islands. Right. And a one child policy like the CCP imposed in China was um, unavailable to LDP governments. You couldn't just do that. Um, and for a while with the economic uh, boom, you know, maybe they were just going to buy the Philippines, right? Maybe we're going to, maybe California is where we're going to send everybody. Mm -hmm. um, but once the reality of um, economic 
stagnation settles in, then the demographic collapse takes on a different character. It's no longer uh, pure bad, but potentially it's a way to adjust without needing to um, without needing to do more invasive. Um, yeah, so the Japanese incel is not such a bad thing. The the Japanese uh, right now um, they like the low. You know, there's a case to be made for the low population um, growth, but the costs, the the social transformations in Japan, um, and uh, this is one reason why I think Shinzo Abe's social conservatism helped win votes. Right, mm -hmm. this is one reason why um, there is space for uh, right wing traditionalism on issues such as gender or um, you know what we could call lifestyle. The um, culture doesn't really know what to do with um, living through this decline and with a generation of young people in which a substantial portion are just kind of waiting or just kind of superfluous. And in a culture that values seniority, um, it's hard to make space for the young because you have to look after the old first. Um, and you do have a steady exodus of um, Japanese talent um, with no uh, concomitant inflow. Um, every effort at liberalizing Japanese immigration rules has run into serious backlashes and um, there isn't much of an appetite for um, a Western style multiculturalism or um, large scale immigration. Mm. The what happens with the frustrated young people is being diagnosed from the right as a kind of cultural spiritual problem where we need to sort of double down on you know traditional roles and the cultivation of of a kind of family-based excellence among young people but a confusion, no clear plan as to how I mean, to do that. The and foundation also, for that is just gone. You can yeah, the, want that all you want. And, but. The material foundation is gone. And the cultural transformation has taken place so fundamentally that you can have people that are struggling with housing or with... Um, you know, their material needs in big cities. Meanwhile, villages are getting completely depopulated, empty houses, nature coming in and, and recolonizing rice paddies. You're not going to get people moving to be rice farmers. People, you know, young people don't want to do that. That's not a, that's not a life they, they envision. It's not a life they're prepared for, right? There's, skills and dispositions that go along with uh, being getting, getting up yeah. early, you know, getting out on the field, working all day, lots of hard work. It, it can be a very rewarding life. And I have a tremendous amount of respect for people who grow our food. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but uh, I couldn't do it. And no, I, I, I wouldn't want to, I don't think I could do it either. Uh, and, and uh, yeah, I mean, Right. It, it, it just, so how much, so, just on a, on a side note, how much of the Japanese agricultural economy is um, centralized now and how much is automated? And I mean, it's not like the rice paddies are going to waste and people are going hungry in Japan, right? I mean, these rice paddies aren't serving a productive purpose in the economy. They would be built, I guess, up to be exports. If they were 
so um, Japan, and this is another wartime legacy. Um, Japan and the purpose of the agricultural subsidies. Uh, Japan went hungry in the final stages of World War II because it relied on agricultural imports from occupied territories elsewhere in Asia. The United States enjoyed complete um, maritime uh, supremacy and Japanese were dying of starvation. Um, after the war, the agricultural subsidies and the care for the rural communities was intended to prevent that from ever happening again. And I think that it was in the relatively recently in the, um, maybe in the, in the nineties or early two thousands, Japan had to import rice for the first time, which was a big moment. The rice farming is inherently difficult to um, mechanize. And when you look, if you go to a grocery store in Japan, there will be imports of certain types of food, which are cheap. Food grown in Japan is generally very high quality and very expensive. Um, for instance, they have the, the square watermelons, mm -hmm. which um, it's very labor intensive to grow them like that. And they shape them using um, forms that the watermelon grows into. And the um, reason that they're square is for better stacking. It's a right. space efficiency thing. Yeah. Each unit of agricultural output in Japan is valuable enough for that kind of high touch, um, high labor input um, production. And there's a willingness. It's a little like the farmer's market thing in uh, the U S there's a willingness to pay more for quality that is willing us to pay more for made in Japan. Um, and the political deal only works if you don't centralize the agriculture, because if the subsidies start going to giant agribusiness and the small farmers get wiped out, then they're not going to vote for you. You lose the rural constituencies. There you go. That's the end okay. of the LDP uh -huh. block. Hmm. Um, as a result, there are probably certain crops and certain types of um, agricultural production, which may be centralized and may be um, scaled up, but small, fa small scale farming is, is still quite common in Japan. Um, the problem is that these are the communities that are literally dying out uh, the most. Um, the kids move to cities. Uh, nobody moves back. Um, and but, so you've got a situation in the agricultural sector, which is depopulating. And so that does put you in a position to be, have to rely on imported food all well, the time, more, more of it. Is that right? The um, Yes. So there's uh, that problem. Um, one solution that Japan is approaching um, for not just uh, agriculture, but in general, uh, a labor shortage driven by an aging population is um, advanced mechanization, right? Uh, robots, um, different kinds of automated systems that might replace. So using, automation without centralization. Here. Automation without centralization. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Um, the, um, uh, and you mentioned Fordism before in, uh, the comparison with the United States. One of the major differences of Japanese political economy with American political economy is that between, um, the 
um, the efficiency demands of the post-war um, reconstruction where you had to deal with material shortages of all kinds. For instance, uh, Japan imports um, all, you know, virtually all of its oil. So it's a cost to not just the company bot bottom line, but to the national economy every time you waste energy. Uh, so all of these efficiency demands um, are just part of the structure of the Japanese, of Japanese industry. You have um, a relationship with labor where they need labor to um, play an autonomous role in figuring out how to do things more efficiently, how to look after quality, how to uh, improve production processes. Uh, one of the great innovations of Japanese lean production uh, in the auto industry, uh, one of the big differences between American style and Japanese style um, automobile production is that Japanese factory floors had a red button that anybody could hit to stop the line. Any line worker that saw anything wrong, better to stop the line than have a serious um, outage, uh, which endangers um, production on a much greater scale, as well as the health and welfare of workers. And workers are trusted enough to be given that type of discretionary power. You know, nobody expects you to hit that button just because you want a day off. Um, now, that type of worker input is uh, a mainstay of the Japanese economy. And it's where you get the little touches, the details that distinguish Japanese production from the American Fordists. Everything is stamped identically. Nothing gets a, a human look. Let's take the labor and de-skill it and dehumanize it to the greatest extent possible, make it as replaceable and subordinate not the assembly line to the worker, but the worker to the assembly line. Mm -hmm. um, that distinction is, um, is a major one. And that's what allows you to have automation without centralization. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what makes it an, a natural fit. While um, in the U.S., if they're robots, then they're in the Tesla factory and you're not going to get one. Right. Right. So, okay. So we're, we've been talking for almost two hours. Let's, let's see if I can get to uh, the, the question that is really on my mind here, which is given all of this history, how should we interpret the assassination of Shinzo Abe? Uh, uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, Abe. Uh, and and how should we um, think of the political moment in Japan in the context of the the, the, the total picture that we are, that I'm viewing I'm I know through a very American lens, but nonetheless, uh, is this um, assassination uh, a moment of right wing reaction in Japan, or should I think of this as an, a disgruntled uh, worker? Uh, taking his vengeance upon the ruling elite of Japan, um, and what does it have to do with the Moonies and and uh, and, and Shinto and and uh, religious differences? So, I think that um, we could take a look at it from the assassin's perspective. We could take a look at it from the perspective of Shinzo Abe. We could take a look at it from the, the political system. From and take a look at it from Shinzo Abe's perspective. He's gone. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I guess I guess um, it's just blue sky, right? Or the, <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. The but top of yeah. the autopsy gurney. Um, yeah. Right. But um, the assassin was motivated by uh, what I I've heard online, and um, I really want to thank some TIR viewers for. Um, directing me to a, a lot of great material um, and helping me parse all of the um, all of the uh, information that's coming out of Japan, the rumors and official announcements. Um, it looks like 
um, the assassin's uh, mother was a um, member of the Moonies, and she had gone into debt and experienced bankruptcy um, as a result of um, the uh, donations that she made to the uh, to the church. Which, as we know, is no no small affair in Japan still. Precisely. The um, it not only wiped out all of the generational wealth, but um, and I, I don't know the specific details of um, the case of Tatsuya Yamanagi, um, Yamagami, um, the assassin. Um, he was in his 40s. Um, he had uh, quit uh, a job where he was relatively well regarded because of these family issues and the pressure that uh, the financial pressure he experienced um, from that the church donation. Shinzo Abe, as part of his um, kind of anti-left nationalist trans-Pacificism, um, his more assertive international role, um, he I don't know how much of it just has to do with the internal LDP politics and the need to fundraise because the Moonies have an incredible amount of money. Um, I don't know how much of it has to do with uh, deep state security relationships between Korea, Japan, and the United States because the uh, Reunification Church is a major player in um, anti-communist and nationalist um, international affairs in the region. And they have a considerable economic and political footprint in the United States, as well as um, South Korea and, uh, and Asia. But um, Shinzo Abe facilitated the entry of um, the Unification Church into Japan, where, let's face it, if you're a Korean religious movement, it wouldn't be that hard to mobilize some opposition, uh, some public animosity against um, the import of, uh, against your entry into, into Japanese society. So um, Yamagami blamed Shinzo Abe for his personal circumstances. Now those personal circumstances you have the, the breakdown of the Japanese economic model. You have the seriousness of bankruptcy and debt in Japan. You have the, the incel social isolation phenomenon and the, the lack of uh, a structure or uh, an entry point for no longer young people, right? We're talking about a lost generation already. Um, he was in his 40s. Yeah, exactly. Um, and some of them are doing fine, but, you know, many of them are lost. Um, no, no wife, no girlfriend. Um, that type of social atomization, right? All of these pathologies hitting one person and creating the conditions for radicalization and for desperation. Um, so in a lot of ways, um, the assassination is a consequence of the breakdown of this social and economic order, um, which, you know, it's not the same as somebody dying of a fentanyl overdose in a um, bathroom in small town McDonald's in Ohio um, after spending years on the street after losing their home. But it is uh, a different consequence of, of the same social economic breakdown of an old order that uh, people believed used to work. Now, um, with Abe, um, there's a certain element of chickens coming home to roost. Uh, 
he had all of these um, connections with uh, various right-wing um, elements that, you know, the Unification Church, the Moonies, were only one among many. There was also the, the Japanese nationalist far-right, World War II revisionists, um, you know, certain uh, elements of the international deep state. Um, all of that is dangerous to associate with. The, uh, there's consequences for getting too close to groups that have shady money. And in the United States, something like this is much less likely to happen, not because political figures, ex-presidents are um, beloved of the people, but because you don't have the mingling of political figures with the public in under conditions anything like um, you know autonomy or freedom, right? You have very choreographed, high security events with um, political leadership isolated as much as possible from the public, which is perceived as a source of threat. Um, so that is uh, in some cases a, a similarity, right? Like the breakdown of the Japanese system is also affecting um, the leadership. It's delegitimizing them. It's putting putting targets on them. Um, American leadership figures just have taken that for granted for such a long time, but. Now it's happening in, in places where um, people, both international observers and the local population, thought that they'd gotten past that. Yeah. What's going to happen next? Hmm. It's My initial fear was that um, the assassin might be a foreigner and that there was going to be a xenophobic backlash, potentially pogroms. Um, fortunate, like I, I, I was a little relieved when, um, it turned out to be a personal matter, um, rather than something that could easily fall into far right mobilization and the current prime minister, um, uh, Fumio Kishida, um, he does not belong to the far right, um, most aggressively remilitarizing faction, but he will reap some benefits. Um, the LDP did better than expected in elections. Um, I don't think that there's going to be a radical break from um, the kind of center right presiding over long wave stagnation that's, that's taking place in Japan. You know, it's going to continue to shrink economically and, um, and as, as a population, um, and it will continue to manage that um, with the greatest anxiety of experienced by most Japanese being what happens when things get bad in the rest of the world, will that come here? So, and in a sense, it already has. Yeah, okay. in a sense, it uh, in a sense it already has, and there's they things have been settled, have been um, a little muted. The the like global austerity, global economic crisis hasn't hit regular Japanese as directly as it has um, certain other populations. That sense of security may be punctured. So you might have a little bit more public appetite for um, more radical potential solutions, but the LDP is also a conservative force in the small seaway, right? They 
unlike Trump, that and the national conservative wing of uh, the Republican Party in the United States, which benefits by burning it all down. Right? They know that many of the the peak figures of the establishment are inimical to their interests. The LDP, it's a club of insiders. And if they really shake up the system, then they're also undermining the very basis of their social position and their authority. So they got to keep this thing going. Yeah. Well, I feel like I learned a lot in this episode here. It's a, just our, uh, two hours and 10 minutes. I'm going to stop recording here. Um, but thank you for coming on. I think it, uh, we should follow up in the weeks to come. And if not about Japan, but I mean, I'd love to follow up about Japan. Maybe we could talk about a Haruki Murakami for an hour or something. But um, about just world events as they, they continue on. I mean, I know you need to talk to me about uh, Finland. Is that right? And, yeah, uh, Finland and Sweden and yeah, Turkey. Yeah. 